In any presentation of the gospel message without something about the day of judgment is not accurate. It's not correct. It's not complete. This is the backdrop. This is an integral part of the message. And without that, you will not have a proper lens to understand why the Bible says flee from the wrath to come. You will not understand why in the Old Testament there's a story of Lot coming out of Sodom and the fire coming down. That's a parable. That's a picture. That's a prophecy. That's what's coming, friends. That's what's coming on this world. That's what's coming on this generation. What? Fire from heaven. The wrath of God. Judgment. Fury. A lake of fire. Well, what's going to happen? Everyone's going to be burned up unless what you run you run for life you run for the mountains you get out of Sodom or you go down with Sodom period that's the picture that's the message that's the gospel that's an integral part of the gospel okay Ezekiel 33 now I think it was on Friday we I shared out of Ezekiel 33 if you remember we did a Bible study a short Bible study out of Ezekiel 33 so if you remember Um, God spoke to Ezekiel and talked to him about a city that has an enemy coming against them to attack them, and the city will have a watchman. And when the enemy comes, the watchman will um, blow a trejao, blow a, uh, I don't know what it says in English, a trumpet, I guess, blow a horn, a shofar, and then the people will be alerted and they'll know the enemy's coming, so they'll rise up and they'll fight. Right? They'll, they'll protect themselves because there's an enemy coming. And then God turns it and he says, so Ezekiel, I've made you the watchman, the spiritual watchman for Israel. So we see in one case, it's like with one, um, one country against another country. And it's, like it's kind of like a military thing. But then God just says, no, I'm actually talking about a spiritual application of what I just told you. Ezekiel, you are my watchman. And what does it mean is that If God is going to bring judgment against God's people, if God is angry with God's people, if God has something to say, then it's up to Ezekiel to bring that message to them. If Ezekiel brings the message to them and they hear it, then they will be saved. If Ezekiel brings the message to them and they won't listen, they will be lost. But Ezekiel will be saved. If God tells Ezekiel, speak this word to them, and Ezekiel doesn't, they'll all be lost. Even Ezekiel. God will say, I told you to warn them, and you didn't. Their blood is now on your hands. So it's a tremendous responsibility. And we can really make a lot of applications of this to our own lives, especially as Christians with the message of the gospel that we've been entrusted with, that we are to tell people the truth. Now, notice the context. It's a context of warning. And this is something that's often lacking today. People share about Jesus, but they always share, well, you know, if you believe in Jesus, you'll have more peace. If you believe in Jesus, you'll feel happier. If you believe in Jesus, you'll feel more purpose in your life. Now, I don't doubt those things are true. Those are certainly true. But the Bible has a far stronger message than just those things. Those are some extra benefits. But the Bible message is heavy. It talks about warning people to flee from the wrath to come. And a lot of people, unfortunately, they've not yet heard that message. It's the furthest thing from their minds that there's a God out there who's coming to bring judgment against them. Nobody thinks that. Nobody thinks that. Everybody thinks, oh, I'm a good person. I know I'm not perfect. I make mistakes, but everything is okay. And it's like, no, that's, that's not true. That's not how it works. Sin is real. And God's judgment against sin is also real. This is the biblical God we're talking about. We've got to get back to the Bible or we're going to have a false idea of God and we'll have an idol. It's not the real God. This is the God of Scripture that we're talking about. This is the holy, righteous God who is, the Bible says, angry with the wicked every day. Did you realize that? That God is angry every day. Most people would think, no, God's not angry. I mean, that's what the Bible actually says. The Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day. And it also says that God has prepared a place called the lake of fire where the devil, 
and his angels and all the wicked will burn forever and ever and ever. Now, let's understand this. What does that mean but that God's wrath is eternal? If it was only temporary, maybe God would punish for a moment and then it's gone. No. God will be angry with Satan and his angels forever and ever and ever and ever. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. Because the devil is wicked and he's done such horrible things. He's brought such destruction and such damage to God's creation. Do you understand? So how can God not be angry with that forever? We're not talking like a human selfish type of anger. God's anger is a holy anger. It's a righteous anger. So God obviously is going to be angry with Satan and the fallen angels for eternity. But understand this. It's not only, the Bible does say that God created the lake of fire for the devil and his angels, not originally for man. But later the Bible teaches that that's where all men who have not repented will go. That's crazy. Yeah, but that's what the Bible says. So what does it mean? The lake of fire is the place where God's wrath burns forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So that means that God will be angry not only with Satan and his fallen angels forever and ever and ever and ever, but everyone who has lived in a life of sin and never genuinely repented, they will also go there and God's wrath will be against them forever and ever and ever and ever. Now, that's something to warn people about. When you understand it like that, you realize, oh, wait a minute. It's not just tell people about Jesus so that they'll have a happier life. Now, that's true. I think it's true in some ways. But, I mean, the Bible more often tells us to help, tell people, if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to count the cost because there is a lot of sacrifice involved in truly following Jesus. There will be persecution and there will be misunderstandings with people. And we have to give up many things that we like to do to really follow Jesus, you know. That's what it means to deny yourself. And at the very root of what it means to be a Christian is this concept of self-denial. What does it mean but that previously I am doing what I want according to my desires, to become a Christian means I stop doing what I want, when I want, how I want, and now I live for what God wants, how He wants, and I, I surrender to His will. If you've not surrendered to His will in all of life, because He's Lord of all or not at all. You understand that? The Lord is not willing to be like your, your, your lover. You're either married to Him or you're not. He won't be somebody you go and visit on the weekends and say, have a little t good time with them and then you go, about your, your, go back to your regular family. No, that's, that's despicable. And God is not like that. God is, the Bible teaches that God is a jealous God. And He is not willing to share you with anyone else. He wants you all for Himself. He wants all of your life all for Himself. He doesn't want you to give yourself to anybody or anything else apart from Him. I mean as far as the Lord of your life, as far as all of your adoration and your worship and things like that. Of course, as we've been made right with God, then we will serve people. We will love people. You will, you will in a sense, Paul said, um, you gave yourselves to the Lord first and then to us. So there's an order. So in one sense, you see these people on the surface, they're like laying down their lives to be the servants of all. They're, they're working hard to help the other Christians, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, wow, they, they give themselves to us. Yes, but they gave themselves to God. And their expression now of love to God and service to God and worship to God is now serving us. But God is the focus, not you. Not the, so, so the Bible teaches us to, to love one another and serve one another, forgive one another. But what if the person's not worthy of being forgiven? What if the person's not very lovable? What if the person doesn't deserve to be forgiven? It doesn't matter. We do everything as unto Christ, not to whether that person in our eyes deserves it or not. But we do it because we're worshiping Jesus. We're serving Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, um, Whatever you do to the least of these, you've done unto me. When you give, if somebody gives you a cup of cold water in my name, they gave it to me. And so we are called to serve one another. We're called to serve people with the mindset that I'm not actually serving this person, but I'm serving God. I'm serving Jesus. So remember, Jesus spoke a parable, not a parable, but a, 
the, the end times there's going to be a judgment. And he's going to separate people on two sides. On one side, he's going to put the goats. On the other side, he's going to put the sheep. Now, you want to be a sheep, not a goat. What's a goat? A goat is stubborn, self-centered, and does what it's going to do. We had goats when I was a kid, and they are really nasty. They will go and just very stubborn, and they'll chew on everything and just make a mess of everything. And like, not sheep. Sheep are very, very guai, very... Um, Ta'at, very like um, docile, I guess is the word. And, but, um, and uh, so in this story, and or in this uh, message he gave about the goats and the sheep, the goats didn't do anything for anybody. And Jesus came to him and said, when I was in prison, you didn't go visit me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. And they're saying like, well, when did, were you in prison and we didn't go? Or when were you hungry and we didn't feed you? Or when did you need clothes and we didn't give any? Give any? And he said, you didn't do it to these, so you didn't do it to me. And the others, to the sheep, he tells them, you're blessed because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And they're like, when, Lord? When did we... Go to you. When were you in prison and we went there? When, or when were you hungry and we fed you? Or he said, "Whatever you done to these, you did it unto me." See that? See how that works? So there's a judgment at the end, and it's going to be based on what we did. I heard somebody say recently, and I was shocked to be honest. It was a pastor speaking. I don't remember who. And he said, on the day of judgment, it's only going to be one question. Did you believe in my son or not? And I'm like, what Bible verse did he get that from? That's not true at all. That's completely false. Completely false. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Bible... You can read all the verses about the final judgment. Nowhere does it say that's what I'm going to ask. The question is always going to be, what did you do? The final judgment is based on our works. Of course... The works that will qualify are going to be the ones that we did as a born-again Christian. So the faith part, of course, is very important. Our faith and repentance at the beginning and then a life following that of righteousness. And then the judgment, and then we have a whole life of righteousness, and then he'll judge us according to our deeds. There's no um, conflict here, but we have to understand the final judgment will be according to our works. So there'll be many people who will say to him in that day, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. Why? Because you didn't do the will of my Father in heaven. So, okay. So where did we read to just now? Or did we read? We didn't read. Okay, I'm just retelling this part. Um, yeah, so Ezekiel is God's messenger to warn the people. Now, I want to tell you something. You need to be warned. Now, whether you hear the warning or not, that's up to you. But the reality of life, the reality of God, the reality of sin, the reality of the final judgment implies we must be warned. Why? Because we often don't know the reality of these things. We don't know there's going to be this final judgment. We don't know God's prepared a, a lake of fire where his wrath will burn forever. We don't know that God is so angry with the wicked every day. I mean, did you learn that? If you... If you learn, if you go to Sunday school, if you go to Christian school, did they teach you that? I bet they didn't. I bet they did not teach you that the God is angry with the wicked every day. Why? Because it sounds so hard. I don't care if it's hard or not. It's Bible, man. And we need to know the Bible, not according to what we like to hear, but what we need to hear. And sometimes warnings are not easy to hear, but we need to be warned. Why? Well, because there's a possibility that if somebody hears the warning, they will actually turn. And what if they don't? They'll perish forever in a lake of fire. Do you, do you, 
Do you know how horrible that is? Have you really ever just sat down and thought about that? That there is a place called hell and it's eternal? There's a place called a lake of fire and if you're not right with God, when you die or on the final judgment, God will cast you there and never bring you out? That's real. 100% real. Do you not think that that's something that we need to be warned about? Afraid of? Why do you think Jesus spoke about hell so much? You know what he said to the Pharisees? You brood of vipers, how will you escape the flame of hell? That's what Jesus said. Jesus, the Son of God, came to this world and taught people about hell. It wasn't the only thing he taught, but it was an important thing in his message. Why? Because it's real. And he loves people. And he's came to warn. Why? Because love warns. Love warns. When somebody is in imminent danger and you say nothing, do you love them? If there's a house burning down and your child is in there, are you just going to just smile there and just sit, let them sleep on until they burn to death? Are you, no, you have to be insane. Do you know what we're talking about is far worse than your child burning up in a house. We're talking about a soul forever in a lake of real fire. Not a house burning and they feel pain for a few moments and then they're dead. A soul perishing forever under God's fiery furnace of wrath. Do you not think that we have to be utterly even slapped in the face? I mean, anything is better than going there. Anything is better than going there. But we prefer to sleep. No, don't talk to me about that stuff. Ah, that's not that. It's not really that. that is, it is that. That's what it is. If you believe in God at all, then you must believe this. And if you don't believe this, you don't believe in God. Period. You're not a Christian. If you don't believe this, you're not a Christian. You do not know Jesus. I, I've met many people that claim to be Christians or they claim to be Catholics or whatever. And when I talk to them about, about certain things, they all say, no, 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 we don't believe that. Oh, yeah, everybody's a good person and they'll make us. They're not really Christians. They are not really followers of Jesus when they believe that. Why? Because if you believe God, you must believe his word. If you be really believe in God, then you must believe what he has spoken. If you don't believe what he has spoken, you don't think he's serious, you're calling him a liar. You understand that? That's calling God a liar. Nowadays, a lot of people are calling God a liar. Now, I don't think most of them do it intentionally. I think they do it blindly, ignorantly, because they don't know the Bible. That's the sad thing about this generation. So many people, so many opinions about God, and so little time in the Scripture, so little time finding out what God has spoken to us, so little time learning the actual contents of the Bible. But they have an opinion about everything. It's so ridiculous. What is it? It's a YouTube opinion. They learned their theology on YouTube. Learn your theology in the Scripture. Learn it in the Bible, and then you'll agree with almost everything I preach. And then you'll say, oh, amen. Oh, that's right. The reality is, there is a judgment on the way. And this provi provides, in a sense, the whole backdrop of the Christian message. What? What backdrop? A very dark day on the horizon. That's, that's the whole picture. When you read through the prophets in the Old Testament, they're always talking about this day. They called it the day of the Lord. All the prophets spoke about it. And they spoke about it in slightly different ways, but it's all pointing to this day. The New Testament continues that theme. calls it the day of judgment. It's the day when all men will stand before God and give an account. In fact, Paul preached that in his very first sermon in Athens to a bunch of unbelievers. He didn't say much that day, apparently, but two things he did said. Number one, he said, you must repent. And number two, he said, because you're going to give an account before this man, Jesus, who is going to be your judge. So you understand, when you read the book of Romans, when you read through the New Testament in general, there's a backdrop of this, and especially the book of Revelation. There's this day that's coming. It's not a good day. It's a bad day. It's a dark day. It's a gloomy day. It's the day of God's vengeance. It's the day of God's judgment. It's the day of God's wrath. 
Listen, if you don't know that, you don't know Christianity at all. That's the whole backdrop. Without that in the picture, I don't know what you know, but it's, it's not correct. That's the whole idea of the wrath of God in the day of judgment. Paul said, ex- pr- exactly in Romans, he said, accor- he talked about how Jesus will judge all men according to my gospel. He says, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. W- wait, what did he say? In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. So he's talking about the day of judgment where Jesus will judge not just the deeds, but the secrets of men according to my what? According to my gospel. What does it mean? That an integral part of his gospel preaching was preaching about the day of judgment. And any presentation of the gospel message without something about the day of judgment is not accurate. It's not correct. It's not complete. This is the backdrop. This is an integral part of the message. And without that, you will not have a proper lens to understand why the Bible says flee from the wrath to come. You will not understand why in the Old Testament there's a story of Lot coming out of Sodom and the fire coming down. That's a parable. That's a picture. That's a prophecy. That's what's coming, friends. That's what's coming on this world. That's what's coming on this generation. What? Fire from heaven. The wrath of God. Judgment. Fury. A lake of fire. Well, what's going to happen? Everyone's going to be burned up unless what? You run. You run for life. You run for the mountains. You get out of Sodom or you go down with Sodom. Period. That's the picture. That's the message. That's the gospel. That's an integral part of the gospel. And if that's been forgotten, I'm sorry, the gospel has been forgotten. You can't leave that out. You cannot leave that out. So many people think that it's okay, la, santai, santai. God is very kind in this sense that he just doesn't really care. And they're going to go down in Sodom. He said, get out of Sodom. In fact, the angels had to grab him, forcibly take Lot and his family out. Why? Because God would have destroyed them as well. Do you know that? God would have destroyed them as well. Remember? When Balaam was going to curse Israel, he'd been called there, and he's on his donkey. And then his donkey starts doing these weird things, like he tries to go straight, and then it goes left, and then he goes right, and then he gets to a really narrow place, and he stops and sits down, and Balaam is furious. He's like, what are you doing, you stupid donkey? He starts beating, he said, if I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you. And then the donkey spoke. I don't know if it's... Well, I was going to say the only time it's not. There was a serpent that spoke and a donkey that spoke. But it spoke to him and said, is this my custom? Do I normally do this? He said, no. And then his eyes were open and he saw there was an angel in front with a sword. And you know what the angel did? The angel said, if you would have kept coming, I would have killed you and let the donkey live. He was right at the point of being killed. Right there. It would have happened. It's not a joke. It's reality. God's wrath was against Balaam because he was going to curse Israel and God told him, don't go. Death was right before him. It would have happened if his donkey did not sit down on the ground. Judgment is real. The danger is real, the wrath is real, and it's a holy and righteous thing. It's not theoretical, it's not symbolic, it's what it is, it's reality. And we need to know it. And if we don't know it, we are much worse off so God raises up a watchman, Ezekiel, sends, them, sends him to Israel and tells him, you wicked people, repent. Well, what do you think they said? They said, good job, thank you, okay, let's do it. No, that's not what happens. They say, you shut up, you heretic, you fanatic. Don't you know that God is happy with us all the time, no matter what we do? 
Well, who had spoken to Ezekiel? It was God. He wasn't preaching his own message. He wasn't just angry, saying, oh, well, you guys are living like that, and, and I don't get to, so I'm just going to condemn you for it. He was giving them the word of the Lord. God is the one that was angry with them, not Ezekiel. Who are they rejecting when they reject Ezekiel? They're rejecting God. They're rejecting God. No, they're rejecting Ezekiel. No, who is he speaking for? Who is Ezekiel speaking for? Who is he representing? God. Therefore, when they reject him, they reject God. When they accept him, they accept God. You can't separate it. Jesus said, when they receive you, they receive me. When they reject you, they reject me. There's this sort of a luxury idea these days where people feel like, Ah, that preaching is not to my taste. They reject the church. They reject the preacher. They reject the message. No, they didn't just reject a church. They didn't just go to another church that I like. They reject God. If the word is true, the word is from God, and they just say, well, I don't like that sort of preaching. You're not rejecting a man. You're not rejecting a church. You're rejecting God. You can choose a thousand. Somebody the other day put a bunch of criticisms on some video I had on YouTube. And um, I finally just responded. And I said, you know, you've watched a lot of my videos. And you've given negative comments on every one. I said, why don't you just go and find yourself a preacher that you like? I said, you can find a thousand out there. There's a thousand. You can find 10,000 preachers out there that preach what you want to hear. But for here, for me, I'm going to preach the word of God. That's it. I was about as direct as I get on those comments. I'm usually very gentle, and I think I was gentle, but the point is, it's like, why are you wasting your time here? You don't like what I'm saying. You don't like what I'm preaching. You don't like what I'm teaching. No, why waste your time? Go somewhere else. Don't, why torment both of us? The reality is, I don't think it's he doesn't like me. I think he doesn't like God. Somebody made a comment on one of my Chinese videos, and they said, it would be much better if he just preached in his, first, in his native language. It would just be much more better. Was like, that was the stupidest comment anybody could have ever made. In the, oh, oh, yeah, of course, duh. Of course. Of course, if I preach in English, it's going to be better than in Chinese. I'm an American. That took a lot of, that took a lot of insight. That was a very deep, no, what was it? He didn't like what I said, so they said it. Find something to criticize. Oh, well, his Chinese is not that good. He had grammar issues. What I'd like to say, and I won't say, I would say, oh, oh, so you just didn't understand anything I said because my Chinese was so poor. You couldn't understand the message at all, right? Nonsense. They could understand every single thing I said. I know my Chinese is not perfect. I don't, I'm an American. I'm not a Chinese. But I know my Chinese is understandable by all if they want to know what I'm saying. If they want to know what's being taught, they'll understand it. The problem is not, oh, well, your grammar or your pronunciation is not good enough or it's not accurate enough. That's not a problem. The problem is, did you like or dislike what you heard? When people like it, they say, they say, they say wow, nobody would ever even think of the fact that you're, you're, not a, you're not a native Chinese speaker, for example. They would never even bother with those issues. They would just be, praise God, this American learned Chinese so he can preach the gospel to us. They're never going to focus on those little things when they, when they receive the word of God. But when you reject the word of God, then you start to pick out the flaws. You start to find little, you start to nitpick. You start to find little things, oh, this I don't like, or this is not my taste, or, or you should have used this verse instead, or whatever. It's like, what is that? So often that's, the fruit of a heart that's fighting against God, resisting God, rejecting God's message. So Ezekiel is calling them to turn. Why not? Why? Why Why do they need to turn? Because if not, the wrath of God is is coming against them and they're going to perish, okay? That's what's happening. That's what we're dealing with here. That's the backdrop of this. God is angry with Israel. Now, notice this, and when you go through the Old Testament, you'll find this. God's angry with everybody. Here, he's angry with Edom, and he's going to destroy them. Here, he's angry with, uh, for example, um, Moab, and he's going to send in enemy armies to destroy them, burn them to the ground. Here, he's angry with Egypt. There, he's angry with Assyria. 
Here he's angry with Israel, and here he's angry with Judah. Who does that leave out? Nobody. He's angry with everybody. Why? Isn't God a God of love? Yes, he's a God of love, but he hates sin. He hates wickedness. He hates rebellion. He hates uncleanness. He hates violence. He hates uh, sexual immorality. He hates greed. He hates murder. He hates l dishonesty and lying and all these wicked things. He hates idolatry. He hates when he is forgotten. And he hates it when people make an image and say, this is God. It, it would be like you going home to your parents with somebody, another, another man older than you. Go home to your parents and say, this, this guy comes home with you and says, who's this? Oh, it's my dad in front of your own dad. Who's that? I don't, I don't know. Who are you? To your own dad. Now, this is my dad. Hey, dad. You know, it's like, what the heck? I'm your father. You're calling this stranger your father? And you're rejecting, you're denying, I don't even know you. Who are you? Get out of here, man. What are you trying to control my life? This is my dad. You don't think your father's going to be deeply insulted, deeply offended, even angry? What, this rebellious son, I raised him all these years, and now he calls somebody else his father? And he publicly humiliates me and rejects me and even denies me. In fact, he even denies that I exist. He would be furious. He would be grieved. He'd be wounded. He'd be hurt. And he'd be furious, which is precisely what the Bible describes God's feelings as in dealing with sinful mankind. He's grieved and he's angry all at the same time. There's love and there's anger all at the same time. If not, there would be no, no such thing as the cross. The cross is not just a revelation of God's love. It's a revelation of God's wrath. It's a revelation of his righteousness. If there was any possible other way, any other possible way, he would never, 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 never send his only begotten, beloved, sinless, blameless, eternal sin to such a miserable, horrible death on a cross. Never, ever, ever, ever. There was no other way. Because sin is that serious. Because the judgment is that strong. Because his wrath is that strong. There was no other way to appease it. There was no other way to satisfy justice. There was no other way for God to show mercy to the multitudes without a worthy sacrifice. And Jesus was the worthy sacrifice. The cross in no way um, downplays or obs obscures the wrath of God. It's a revelation of the wrath of God. We've just been taught, oh, the love of God, true. If it's God's love, why a cross? It makes no sense at all unless you understand the holiness of God, unless you understand the righteousness of God, unless you understand the sinfulness, the rebelliousness of man. That's the only way the cross makes any sense at all. People like to preach the gospel of love. It's so cheap. It's not real love. They, just talk, they talk about a sentimental type of love. Oh, he just loves you as you are and you're just so good and he just loves you and he just wants to bless you. It's like, is that all there is to it? Yeah, that's it. That's not what the Bible says. What, and what, with the people nowadays, when they overemphasize grace and they overemphasize love, they're actually, in my opinion, they are, I could try to think of the word, but um, they are denigrating love denigrating grace. They're not exalting grace. They're doing the opposite. They're making it a very little thing. They're making God's great love. The Bible speaks of God's love in the context of God sending His perfect, obedient, beloved Son to die for His enemies that are on their way to an eternal lake of fire. And they are the ones crucifying Him. Now that is love. That is Bible love. It's a, it's a strong thing because it's a war going on between God and mankind. 
Man is risen up in arms against God. And therefore, God is risen up against men. There's this ongoing conflict, this epic battle from the garden till now. And in the middle of it, God throws his son in there and allows him to be crucified and raises him from the dead so that he might bring peace between both sides. Peace where there was no peace. That's a strong thing. Yeah, because that's the true Bible message of the gospel. That's, that's love. When you understand the, how God's fury against sin, when you understand the eternity of these judgments, when you understand how deep our sin really is, how depraved our nature really is, and you understand the salvation through the blood, the innocent blood of His Son. That's the only way of salvation. The innocent blood of His Son. And you get washed in that blood and renewed by His Spirit. Now you know something of grace. Now you know something. Now you know something of love. It's not just good feelings and nice poetry and a romantic type of love. That's not the Bible idea of love. The Bible idea of God's love is a God who gave His Son to be crucified for those very ones that hate him. And in some sense, he also hates them. So what the Bible teaches as well. People don't know that. But all over the Old Testament, there's verses that says God hates the wicked. Did you know that? People say, he loves, he loves the sinner but hates the sin. Show me that Bible verse, please. I can show you many that say he hates the sinner. But I can't find any that says he loves the sinner but hates the sin. It says he hates the sinner. You said, but doesn't, it, doesn't the Bible say God so loved the world? Yes. Doesn't it say that while we were yet sinners, he gave his son to die for us? Yes. That's why I say that in some sense, he both loves and hates at the same time. How do you explain that? I don't. I don't need to. It's just a reality. We accept it with fear and trembling. That's why the Bible speaks in, in Psalm, I think it's one, um, Psalm 2, rejoice with trembling. We rejoice when we get the message of grace and we're trembling at the same time. Oh, this, the love of God, the mercy of God is coming. Yes, and be afraid as well. <laughs> be careful when you stand, when you think you stand, lest you fall. You know, there's these people that they emphasize grace in such a way, you cannot fall. You can't make God angry. You cannot come under judgment. I can give you, give you 10,000 verses that contradict exactly every point. That's totally not true. You, oh, you're beyond any sort of a danger now. But what that does, the danger of that is, now you won't be on guard. Now you'll be that much weaker. What did Jesus tell his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane? Watch and pray. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Watch and pray. Why? Lest you fall into temptation. Does that not simply imply there was a real possibility that they would fall into temptation? Of course. And that's what, exactly what happened. Did they watch and pray? No, they didn't. Did they fall into, into temptation? Yes, they did. That's why Jesus warned them. We live in a false world where we think nothing will ever happen, God will never do anything, or there's no consequences to decisions, that's, a, that's an illusion. It's not the reality. The reality is there's consequences for every single decision we make. We live in a world that you cannot go anywhere and God will not be there. It's impossible. You cannot escape from God. You can put him out of your mind. You can hate him. You can speak against him. You can say you don't believe in him, but you cannot escape him Anywhere you go. God, in some sense, he fills the entire universe. His presence is what we call the omnipresence of God. It means he's present everywhere at the same time. You cannot run. You cannot hide. You cannot flee from the presence of God. Everywhere you go. You can run from me. You can hide your thoughts from others. 
You can even cover your face, your emotions, keep everything inside, and God sees it all. It's impossible to hide. So, in Ezekiel 33, verse 11, after God spoke to Ezekiel, said that you're the watchman and you're to warn Israel, turn, command the wicked to turn from their sins, he says this in verse 11, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Listen, you must understand this. There is a lake of fire. There is an angry God in heaven against sinners. But you must understand this verse is a thousand percent true. God does not want you to die in your sins. God does not want you to burn in a lake of fire forever. God does not want anyone to perish. He does not desire it. He takes absolutely no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I like the way that it reads in Chinese. And if you know Chinese, then you'll, you'll, you'll hear it. But it says, 我断不喜悦恶人死亡。我断不喜悦恶人死亡。唯喜悦恶人转离所行的道而活。it's, it's, it's, for me, it's even stronger in Chinese. I take no pleasure. I have no enjoyment. Completely don't, do not like. Completely do not desire. Completely do not want the wicked to die in their sins. Now, remember the backdrop. There's a day of gloom and doom. There's a dark day on the horizon for all of mankind. We're all going to face it. It's the judgment of God. What's the current status? God's angry with the wicked every day. It's universal. There's no exceptions. Even against people that go to church if they're not in Christ, not truly in Christ. And then we come to a verse like this and God's making clear, listen, people, Yes, it's true. I'm angry. Yes, it's true. There's this day. Yes, it's true that you're in my wrath right now. But listen, I don't want you to die. I take no pleasure in it. I don't desire it. I don't want it. I'm not delighted by it. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. What does he have pleasure in? He tells us, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live. God wants you to live. Every single one in here, God wants you to live eternally in paradise in his presence forever. God does not want you to die in your sins. God does not want you to perish. God does not want you to be cast into a lake of fire forever. He wants you to turn and live. But here's the problem. There still is a lake of fire. And people are still going to go there. And possibly people in this very room right now hearing this message. Wait, isn't God almighty? Like he has all the power in the universe? Like there's no power outside of God's power. All power is God's power. Even the power we have or the creation, it's all God's power. He just gives it on loan. Yes? Then how could it possibly be that the all-powerful God, almighty God, doesn't get his way. Because he said, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but I only take pleasure in them turning and living. But yet, people still perish. People still die in their sins every day, all around us. It's happening. But God tells us very clearly in many places, not just here, also in Matthew 23, 37, he said, when Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her, her chicks under her wings. He wanted to bring them together. He wanted to embrace them. He wanted to love upon them. He wanted to bless them. He wanted to save them. 
But what, was, what happened? But you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. And li listen to this part, 2 Peter 3, 9. Not willing, He's not willing, He doesn't want, He does not desire that any should perish. Nobody, none, zero. He's not willing that any perish, but that all, all, pause in the Greek, pause, or in Spanish, todos, or in Chinese, trenbu, or in Indonesian, samwanya, or sagalanya, or I don't know which word is right, but all. He wants all to come to repentance. But wait, he's Almighty God, right? He wants this to happen, but does it happen? No, it does not. There's a contradiction. He says, I want it, and he has all the power, but yet it doesn't happen. How is this possible? 1 Peter 2.3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, verse 4, who desires all men to be saved. He desires it and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He desires it, but it doesn't happen. Is this not an affront to the sovereignty of God? Some people think so. Some people think so. So what they do is they turn these verses and say, even though God said, I don't desire the death of the wicked, he doesn't really mean it. Some people turn these verses where it says I, he desires that all come to repentance and they turn the all into another meaning. Because when they read it like that and they see it doesn't happen, they can't make any sense of it. So they say, well, it must not really mean what he said. I'm not the type that believes God just lies, okay? So if he said he wants all, it must mean all. If he said he doesn't take delight in the death of the wicked, he must not take delight in the death of the wicked at all. Zero. Period. It's not his will. It's not his desire. It's not his plan. So then how do we explain this seemingly contradiction, the seeming contradiction that he's almighty, he's all-powerful, yet he doesn't get what he wants? Only one explanation. It's a very easy explanation. It's, a very, it's the biblical explanation. Is this. God's will is that none should perish, that's true. But it's in the context that they have a part to play in responding to God's offer. And His will to grant men a freedom in this matter is higher than His will that all will be saved. He's created a universe where we are made in His image. And part of the mean of that is that we have a certain degree of autonomy. We're not robots. And God made it that we can actually choose to do something He doesn't want us to do. That's hard to understand, yep, but that's what the Bible teaches very clearly, very plainly, very easily, everywhere. You choose this day whom you will serve. I have to choose, of course. Why? Because you're not a robot. God is not going to force it. God provides salvation. God gives the offer, like with Ezekiel. He gives the warning. Turn, people, turn, lest you perish. If they listen and they obey, they will be saved. If they don't listen, they will be doomed. Who determined if they would be saved or if they would be doomed? They did. Based on what? Do they want to obey or not? Do they want to believe it or not? Do they want to follow or not? They have a role to play. We do not live in a fatalistic world where every decision is already predetermined. We do not live in a world where we're all a bunch of robots and God has programmed everything before time began and now everything is just happening exactly according to how he programmed it to happen. That's not the world that we live in. That's not the, the world the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches a world where there's a sovereign God ruling over all and he made these little people and gave them a freedom of choice in this whole creation. A role to play in our own salvation. This is undeniable. The scripture teaches it everywhere. 
What's the role to play in Ezekiel 37, 11? If you want to be saved, you must do something. What? You must turn from your wicked ways and live. And then he goes on, turn. Turn from your evil ways. That's the role, not of God, but of man. Many people are confused about what God will do and what they should do. I want to tell you one thing. God will not repent for you. Many people, I've, I've, I've come across this many times, um, and I, I think what it is, it's a manifestation of their hardness of heart and their unwillingness to change. They'll say, yes, it's true what you say. Yes, I do want to be saved, but pray for me so that I will repent. And sometimes I'm like thinking like, no, you make your choice. You want to repent or not? It's not pray for me, pray for you that you will repent. That's so ridiculous. Do you understand what's happening there? You're you're, you're pushing off the responsibility. You, you're, you're putting it on somebody else. No, no, the, the responsibility of repentance is on you. You're the one that has to, like, it's like this. Ezekiel came out with his horn. Hey, hey, there's an army coming. There's a, the enemy's going to come and invade the land. And they say, yeah, pray for me that we'll respond to this warning. That's stupid. No, the warning came. Da, 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 da. Now run and get ready or you're going to die. And they're like, um, would you pray for us that we would be willing to run? No. I'm not going to pray for you that you'd be willing to run. So there's things that God wants to do and they won't get done. How is that possible since he's God Almighty? This is how it's possible because he's made a universe where we have to respond, that we have a certain degree of autonomy, of freedom, and our participation will oftentimes determine the results. If you respond, you'll be saved. If you don't respond, you will perish, period. That's how it works. We see it throughout the scripture. We even see it in the case of Nineveh. Remember when God sent Jonah to Nineveh and he said 40 days and 40 nights and Nineveh will be overthrown? Judgment is coming. You're doomed. 40 days and 40 nights. He already gave the prophecy. The word of the Lord. God spoke. You're doomed. It's done. What happened? They fasted and they prayed. They put on sackcloth and ashes. And what happened? God had mercy on them, and it didn't come to pass. Well, how is that possible? Well, God gave the warning. Um, Jonah, uh, Jonah gave the message, and they responded, and God didn't do it. He withheld the judgment. So their participation actually somehow affected what God was going to do. In another case, God sends his son to Israel to God's own people to bring the kingdom of God to them and they reject him, crucify him, nail him on a cross and put him away. So what happens? God sends Roman and destroys Jerusalem, brings judgment to all the Jews that were still there. It could have been avoided. God sent Jesus to them for blessing but because they rejected him, they brought a curse. It brought a judgment. It brought a serious, most uh, devastating judgment from God. To this day, never recovered. So what we see is that God is almighty, but he's limited himself. You say, how can God limit himself? Well, think about this. Did God come into this world before or not? Did God come into this world as a man or not? Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Word become flesh. How is it possible that Almighty God, infinite God, can become flesh? I don't know, but it happened. So in some sense, Jesus set aside his divine prerogatives 
and accept, accepted the human body and limited himself to be in one time and place, you know, to be in, to be in one place at, at one time. In other words, God is everywhere, but when Jesus became a man, he was only in one place at one time. He limited himself. He limited his knowledge. Jesus was not omniscient when he was on the earth. He did not know everything. He even said, I don't even know when I'm returning. Only the Father knows that. His knowledge was limited. He limited, now, he purposely limited his knowledge. He purposely limited his actions. He only ministered in Jerusalem or in Israel. Judea mostly. He didn't go around the whole world. God's everywhere at the same time, but not when Jesus came to earth. He was only in one place at one time. He purposely limited himself. Why? Because that's what he wanted to do. Because that's how he's working out his plan. Is it possible that God could create a world where we're all just robots and he makes us all do whatever he wants to do? Of course, he could do that. Why not? He could do it, but it's not what he's done. It's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to make a world where we have to make real choices and there's real consequences or real benefits or blessings to the choices that we make. So what I want to say is this. Let me just kind of wrap up here. Salvation is provided, but you choose this day who you will serve. You repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news and you will be saved. If you don't, what Mark 16 says, you will be damned. Go into all the world, Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. It's God's will that all would repent, that none will perish. He takes no pleasure and the death of the wicked. Well, what's going to make the difference? Personal response. God has limited himself and allowed people to make their own choice. That's how it works. Now, I want to expand this concept to another area as well. So, the first area we are applying it to is in the area of salvation. But you have to understand, as a born-again Christian, there's many things in our lives that are determined by our choices. Our spiritual growth is not just God's just going to make you grow. God will make you grow depending on how you live depending on how much you read his word, depending on how much you pray, depending on your choices, then you will grow. If you don't make those right choices, you will not grow. You say, well, God didn't make me grow. No. You did not do what God told you to do so that he would send his blessing upon you and you would grow. It's not, we're not in a fatalistic world where God decides everything. If you're cold and lukewarm and not in a good place spiritually, it's because of your own personal choices. It's not because of God. It's because of you, 100%. It's because of your own personal choices. If you're on fire, if you're in love with the Lord, if you're, you're seeking after God with your whole heart, it's also because you've made right choices. And one right choice was you came to church this morning. Amen. So gong shi for that. But so spiritual growth, revival. Is it possible that there's times in history where God wanted to do something very special in a, in a church or in a city? But the people had no ears to hear. The people had no response in their hearts, so God left them. So God passed them by. Friends, it happens every day. Don't let it happen to us. 
It could happen to us. Remember God wanted to bring Israel into the land of Canaan, but because of their, un, their disobedience and their unbelief, they were cursed to die in the wilderness. God wanted to do something very special with that generation. He wanted to bring them into the promised land and let them experience the full abundance of his promises. But because they refused to obey, they refused to believe, they all died in the wilderness. God wanted to bring a revival. God wanted to move powerfully. But the, his people would not obey it. So often we're, we think that we're waiting on God. I wonder if it's not the other way around. I wonder if it's not that God is waiting on us. God is waiting on us to respond. God is waiting on us to do what we need to do so that we can receive what he has prepared for us. Listen to this. If God wants to provide, you know, God wants me to eat, he'll just bring me food. Do you believe that? You know, God has promised I'll give you food to eat. i will take care of all your needs. So, so you're just going to sit in your house and you're just going to wait for somebody to knock on your door. And uh, they're going to, you're going to bring a plate and just full of food every, you know, three times a day, four times a day, whatever. You're God, see, God's feeding me. You're waiting. You will starve. You'll starve. So, but God said he will provide food for me. Yes, that's true. But he said, go to work, make money, buy food, and cook it, and God provided for you. Oh, you mean I actually have to do something? Yeah, that's how it works. Same with salvation, same with spiritual growth, same with God's work in our lives, in our families, in our church, through our church. Oh, you mean there's actually something we have to do? Yes! And if we don't do it, nothing will make up for it. That's how it works. Well, isn't it just God is sovereign? He just makes everything happen? He could do it that way if he wanted, but he's not chosen to do it that way. He's given us a part to play. He's given us something to do. And if you don't do it, you have to face the consequences of not doing it. I mean, can you imagine? Um, remember, Israel... They were in the wilderness, nothing to eat. So what did God do? He brought a plate of food to their house every morning, to their house, to their tent every morning. No, he didn't. What happened? Manna came down. Oh, I got to get up early and get it. Yep. Why? If the sun comes up, it's gone. So God provided the manna. It's out there. You got to get up. You got to go collect it. You got to bring it home. No, you got to cook it. you got to prepare it. And then you eat it. And you know what? God just provided you a meal. Well, who provided the meal? You or God? Well, God provided the manna, but I had to go and collect it and cook it. So God provided the manna, but you had to participate in the process or you're not going to eat. You're going to be hungry. So many people dry up spiritually. They die on the vine. They don't go forward. They don't advance. They don't learn new things. They don't get new things. They don't have new experiences with God. They don't get new things out of the Bible. Why? They slept in. And when they woke up, the manna's gone. Manna's gone. You got to get it early. You overslept. The manna's gone. The point is, we're too lazy to do what we need to do to get what we want. And then later, you get used to just being hungry. You know if you're hungry long enough, you won't be, feel hungry anymore? Did you know that? If, you're, if, you don't fa if you fast for several weeks in a row, eventually you won't, be, you won't feel any hungry, hunger at all. You have no more hunger for food. It's gone. So we've got this sort of a Christian that's, they slept past the manna like, a week in a row, two weeks in a row, however long it's like they're starving at first, and then eventually they're just used to it. It's okay, la. Don't, no, no problem, la. And then they lost the hunger completely. 
And then they wonder what's wrong with their life spiritually. Why am I not growing? Why don't I have that fire for God anymore? Why don't I have that desire to do anything for God? Why did I lose my vision? I, that's why. That's why. You slept past the manna. You overslept it. Get up. Remember what God told Peter? Rise and kill, Peter. Rise, kill, and eat. Why didn't God just bring a plate to him and say, here it is? No, there was animals there, and God said, rise, kill, and eat. God provided the animals. Peter had to get up and kill them and eat them. It's in his vision when he went to Cornelius' house. But the point is, God's not made us robots, and he's not our heavenly butler that just brings everything to us on a silver platter and says, here it is, sir. Your meal is prepared. I mean, that did happen once in the Bible. Remember who? Anybody know? I, Jelena knows. Who? Who had their meal prepared for them and just brought to them every morning? Huh? Yes, Elijah, when he was running. Special circumstances, special provision. Remember, Israel was previously in the wilderness and God brought manna down. But when they moved into the, the land of Canaan, they, there was no more manna. It stopped. Then they had to go and harvest the crops there. Which one was God's provision? Both. It was just a different, different type of provision for a different season. In both cases, they had to work. In both cases, God did his part and they had to do theirs. Now, I ask you this morning. You say, I want to be saved. I don't want to go to a lake of fire. I don't want to be under the wrath of God. I, say, I ask you this morning, have you done your part? Because that what's, that's what will make the difference. Do your part and you will be saved. Don't do it and you will not. It's not what God wants. God wants you to be saved. That's why you're here this morning. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be forgiven. He wants to forgive you. He wants to cleanse you. He wants to free you. He wants to work in your life. But you have to come and say, here I am, Lord. I lay down my life. I give up my sins. I confess them to you. Wash me. Cleanse me. Renew me. And if you're already a Christian, you say, but my life, I have no power. I have no... So we live powerless lives unnecessarily. What do you mean? Well, he promised the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, what if we don't have it? Then we must ask and seek and knock until we get it. And if we live without it, then we are, we are, we are to be blamed. It's our fault. God, help us and forgive us for accepting such a lame and low level of Christianity when he has promised a land that flows with milk and wild honey and we settle with stale bread and, and bai kai shui and just hot water. I mean, just a little bit of water in a cup. God has provided a luxurious feast for us, but you got to get up and get it. You gotta cry out for it. You gotta call out for it. And if you don't, you will not get it. It will pass you by. Life is passing us by. How many of us, some of us have been Christians for quite a long time. Is the power of God upon your life? Is the Holy Spirit within you? Are his gifts operating? Is his using you? Is his hand upon you? And if not, then why? It's his will for you. It's his desire for you. It's his plan for you. And if not, it's because there's something you're not doing. It's not that God is withholding. It's something that we are withholding. God will give it. Maybe not in one day or two days, but seek and you will find. Ask and you will receive. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Choose this day whom you will serve. I want to tell you, God loves you. Has a plan for your life. He does not desire that you would die, but that you would live. God does not want us weak, broken, backslidden, cold, lukewarm as Christians. He wants us on fire. He wants us to have the Holy Spirit in our lives. He wants us to be overflowing, but sometimes when we're not, we have to ask a question as to why. It's not easy, especially when you think, well, I've been praying and I've been seeking God. You know, there was a time of my life in particular where I was praying every single day I was reading the Bible, etc. And I came to a certain season where God showed me I was backslidden. I was backslidden. I was far from God. My heart was not right with God. It's the facts. It's the truth. Even though I was doing the actions, my heart wasn't in it. And you know, sometimes you go through the actions, you're doing the right things, but your heart's not in it. And it'll have the same effect. You'll dry up. You'll get cold. 
And we've got to get back to seeking him with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul. And then he promised, you will find me. You will find me. We will find him. And so I just want to ask you to join with me and say, that's it. I'm done. I'm done with playing games. I'm going to find God. Let's find God. Let's get a hold of God. Let's seek God and let's find him. Let's not just talk about it. Let's do it. Amen? Can you stand this morning? today will accept your friendship, the friendship that you offer, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Your will is that there be peace, and I pray that each one of us will accept your terms of peace. The, the terms of peace is complete surrender. We can't have peace with God if we hold the weapon in our hands. We've got to lay it all down. got to lay down all the sin and have peace with God. We've got to lay down our self-will, and we can have peace with God. We have to lay down being the Lord of our own life, and then we can have peace with God. Let you be in control. Let you be the Lord. Let your way be our way. Let your thoughts be our thoughts, and let us follow you, no longer the flesh, and we can have peace. Oh, Lord. Bless each one of us today, Lord God, that your word, Lord, will truly burn within us. We will not easily forget it. Mark us today, Lord God. Let it be a key in our lives, Lord. Let it be a turning point from passivity to the realization, I've got to move. I've got to do something. God has provided. God has willed. God has desired. But it's up to me now to respond to what God has given. And I pray, Lord, that each one of us would not be the lazy man who's too lazy to even lift up his hand from the plate to his mouth. I pray nobody in here would be so foolish and so lazy that we would be like the man in Proverbs that's so lazy he won't even lift up his, his hand from the plate to his mouth to feed himself. But Lord, help us today to be energized, to respond, to move, to act, that we may be saved and that we may grow and be transformed. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.